Hello and welcome to the Super League Championship. I'm Randy Bueller, joined by Chris Pakula. Welcome, Chris. Hi. Yeah, I figured we'd start the pregame a few minutes earlier. Chris said everything was up and running and working. Chris and I, we were just talking about vintage. We're like, ah, we could just have this conversation with an audience, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm happy to talk about vintage where the chat can <laughs> tell me where I'm wrong because I haven't played them, you know, in a few weeks, a few months, I guess. So, so just as a hint of big picture context first, Super League Championship is uh, finishing up the group stage tonight. We're going to have playoff competitors by the end of this show. Next week is the Super League Championship playoffs. So we crown the first Super League champion. Uh, then the week after that, Vintage Super League comes back. So uh, Chris has been in all the Vintage Super League so far. He's uh, looking forward to the next Vintage Super League, shall we say, to see what happens in Vintage going to be uh, going to be a super fun format. So we were just talking about, you know, this brave new world of vintage where thirst for knowledge has people playing dirtily blue decks and Rich Shea's been playing painter servant grindstone with thirst for knowledge and you're not sure what to play. Well, I mean I I I I basically heard people talking about Jace, Vrin, you know, Vrin's prodigy and vintage which I had not even I haven't played vintage since that was even a card really. So I I was shocked to hear that people were playing this. Um now, I guess only shock because I hadn't even thought about it. Um, I, I still am having a hard time believing it's as good as people are, as, are saying it is. But. I I, uh, I played a vintage Friday Night Magic at the, lo the local game store a couple of weeks ago. I had, I guess, Tiny Jace. Is that what I should call him? Baby Jace is taken, right? Baby Jace is ba Jace Bellerin. Seems like yeah. this is the baby because he grows up to be uh, whatever. So Tiny Jace, I, I had him in my deck. I had one tiny Jace, I had one Mind Sculptor, and I think I might have been better off with two tiny Jaces and zero Mind Sculptors. Not sure, yeah, one, one might be better, three might be better, but it's definitely a legit vintage card. I mean, turn one off just a land and any off-color mocks, it always sure. flips. Wow. Is that better than just Dark Confident? I, I mean, I don't know. It's You know, you don't have a deck, you don't have a deck full of Dickler Times and Treasure Cruises anymore, although you still have, you know... I mean, you still get one of each... Right, so like you, you don't flash want to back that. the ancestral. I, the the difference from Dark Confidant is that it's blue. Yeah, no, you're right. It's a big that's, deal, right? It's a big deal. Snapcaster Mage is the guy that he really suffers. Like, I think he just, I think it's just a lot better than Snapcaster Mage. Uh, well, you know, if you draw it mid game, it does nothing the turn you play it. Which true. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I'm interested to try. I mean, it, it's it's definitely the restriction of. I mean, it's a new format, right? Chalice of the Void is restricted, and I think that um, I think that's going to change things a bit. Um, yeah. I think that, you know the workshop decks are going to be a little bit worse. Um, you can't get blown up by like Merfolk with Chalice of the Void anymore. Although there might be more Null Rads now. I don't know. We'll see if, if people just switch to Null Rad from Chalice of the Void. Um, yeah, I don't know. It, it definitely. I think it makes Monastery Mentor a little bit better because now at least like, yeah. although you can always just run your Moxes into the Chalice anyway, but. Well, but the thing is that the presence of Chalice of the Void was a real discouragement for playing with all your moxes, right? Yeah. How many mox? Steve Menendian plays an average of like two moxes per deck. Right. I was saying just it's a question of is Null Rod going to replace it? Now, obviously, Null Rod doesn't come out on turn one. I well, got to believe, I got to believe that the number of Chalices plus Null Rods in the old world is a lot higher than the number of, you know, Null Rod plus Restricted Chalice that we're going to see nowadays. I, I mean, I think that the coast is now at least a little bit clear to actually play with all your Moxes. And to your point, that makes Monastery Mentor a lot better, not because you play the Moxes after the Mentor, but because you need to have a bunch of Moxes in your deck to get Mentor onto the table fast right. enough to actually matter. And, and, and depending on how you build your Workshops deck, it is... Workshop decks can lose to their their own null rods can restrict them some games where they they basically were never right. restricted by their own chalice of the void. So that's a great point. Let's look at the the field for the play in. We're talking vintage because we're looking forward to the vintage super league. Uh, it's coming up in a couple of weeks. Vintage super league though, it's not going to kick off with uh, the main season. We're going to kick off with a play in tournament. Vintage super league has this feature where every year or every season we relegate the last place player. He gets kicked out of the league. It was unfortunately David Williams in the in the most recent season. Um, so we got to figure out who our new tenth player is and. We're going to have a tournament. We're going to have these eight guys show up. They're going to play double elimination uh, starting uh, two weeks from tonight. And then the winner wins a spot in the Vintage Super League alongside uh, alongside all the rest of us. So I'm pretty excited by this slate. I mean, David obviously trying to get his way back into the league. you got a couple of Vintage Specialists and Roland Chang and Nick Detweiler. I know he's actually a really good friend of yours. 
Yeah, I mean, I, Nick so Clay, tell us about Nick Detweiler because he's probably the least familiar name on this to uh, to people looking in. Right. So Nick is primarily known for two things. One, he's like a community organizer, like tournament organizer. You know, he runs tournaments. He drives people to tournaments. He gets people's people cards for tournaments that they might need. You know, he helps. You know, he helped me get med the meddling major original art. Like he's just a really he's just a really great guy who like tries to help people be a part of the magic community um, and does whatever he can to do it, whether it's running tournaments himself or helping someone else run tournaments, whatever. He's also basically like, he's just all workshops all the time. It's just, there's no, I mean, he's, if he doesn't have four Misha's workshops in his deck for this tournament, I just, I just can't even, I'm at, I mean, I think he, I mean, he, this is the guy who like owns the original art for Karn. I mean, and I'm not talking <laughs> like Karn Liberator. <laughs> no, 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 Karn. <laughs> yeah. Um, so he's just all workshops. I mean, so and, this could uh, actually be a workshop heavy field then, because that's certainly what Roland Chang is known for playing. Roland as well. is also known for workshops. Um, so I, I think there's, he's not as likely as Nick to play workshops, but still sure. very likely. Um, but I think the rest of the field is extremely unlikely to play workshops. That's fair. Um, um, I mean, Anna, it's really hard to not root for David here. Like, there's obviously <laughs> a, a bunch yeah. of players and people I like a lot, but I would, Agreed. I mean, I just really would like to see David back in the league. That's um, fair. Ulla Rada, by the way, is the guy who designed the uh, Grixis Pyromancer deck I used to win the last Vintage Super League. So that's probably where his sensibilities are going to lie, I would think. Yeah. And he is also, I mean, he's European based. He's, he's going to be calling in from Scandinavia at whatever three o'clock in the morning it works out to be. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at this, these people, and I just don't really want to root against any of them. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're, we're, we can't lose as a league. No, no, the league really can't lose. No. Well, one of these guys will win. So, yeah. Well, the, the, one way the league could lose is if, like, Sam Black plays some vintage deck that takes the full clock to win every time. Or <laughs> like, it just involves so many mouse clicks that he just can't, he can barely finish each match. I guess that, that's, that's, like, the only downside I see. Okay. It'd be, yeah. Sam could break the format wide open, though. Yeah, Who knows so, what Sam what Sam's gonna come up with? Oh, he like he sacrifices something and twenty seven triggers go on the stack. And, <laughs> yeah. I something. Like uh, Other than that, it's all upside. Agreed. I do want to shout out to Puka Trade. By the way, you see the sponsored buy in the upper right hand corner. I've actually got Puka Trade uh, new backdrop to stream in front of now with uh, Puka Trade as well. They are they have stepped in to sponsor the league and uh, make sure we're all able to keep the league going which is which is awesome so hats off to them also i don't know if you know anything about puka trade i actually got uh if you can come back to the commentator shot i now have a flooded strand expedition in the mail thanks to puka trade so oh. i've been just trying to check in the site out i figured if they're going to sponsor it, i should at least understand how the system works and next thing i know i've like dusted off the binders from the 90s in the basement accumulated a bunch of puka points and i have a flooded strand expedition to show nice. for it so I'm not a big Expedition fan myself, but... I, I've got this Canadian Highlander deck that just wants to be shiny. So let me tell you, I, I built a Canadian... Not that we should trip too much time with Canadian Highlander, but I <laughs> built a Canadian Highlander deck. Yeah. I built a Canadian Highlander deck. I drew a fetch land, used it, and went, oh, this format's terrible. <laughs> you just was, don't randomize your deck at that point. You just find was, the land and cut it once or twice and call was, it good. Right, but even there's I knew which land I wanted, so it's one card out of a out of ninety something. Yeah, you have to find it. That's fair. Then, so I don't know. So I'm not sure. Canadian Highlander seems really fun. I'm not sure I'm sold. Um I'd I'd like to have a bigger conversation about these formats. Like I would love it if everyone was on the same page about which of these cool formats we should play. Right. Um, but I'm not sure I'm into this hundred card deck with fetch lands thing. Well it's I mean any the thing is that to have sort of all the sweet replayability and all the sort of crazy scenarios, you kind of need something like 100-card Singleton to give yeah. the, the diversity of gameplay and to be able to sort of have it so that everybody's not just playing all the same broken cards. Yeah, so and I really like it. We, go, we go deep enough so the cards you don't usually see get played. You just want to um, ban fetch lands is what you're really I'm, I'm, I'm leaning towards maybe we, maybe as a community, we need to band, band it together and ban fetch lands for fun formats. Maybe. We'll see. Uh, yeah, obviously it's not my format. It's... Yeah, I mean, uh, Canadian Highlander has turned into the format that the coverage team is playing. Like, when I go off to commentate the GPs or whatever, you know, Marshall's got a deck, and, you know, everybody's got a deck now, and it, they're just fun to play against. Like, the games uh, that yeah. they're 
Really? I agree. They seem super cool, but man, that the Fetchland 100 card thing is brutal. Yeah, yeah that's fair. Totally fair. But <laughs> enough about Canadian Highlander. All right, we started <laughs> early. We got to talk about some fun formats. We should actually talk about what's going on tonight with the yeah, Super League right. Championship. So Never let's have. throw the, uh, the standings up. This is week three of the group stage. So that's the third week. It's groups of four. We played round robin. You can see at this point, all three groups have the same basic structure. Somebody's 2-0. and oh, There's a couple of 1-1s, one and ones, and then there's an 0-2. Oh, also, and this is just kind of randomly worked out this way, all of the matchups tonight are either first versus second or third versus fourth. Just a quirk of the schedule that it's worked out that way. Um Nobody has clinched a bye at this point. Nobody has clinched a group win. One player has, in fact, been eliminated from the playoffs. Uh, Kenji Egashira is definitely out. He's actually the only one who's definitely out. Even Cedric and Paul, uh, Paul Rietzel at 02 can still potentially make the playoffs based on their tiebreakers. Uh, meanwhile, Paul Chion and Lishi Tian have clinched advancement with their 2-0 marks. They have not yet clinched group wins or buys. Uh, Gabby at 2-0, there is a small chance that she could still miss the playoffs. Um, if she loses 0-2 and Sean McLaren wins 2-0, she can wind up third in a three-way tie at 2-1. But she, uh, she either needs a game win or or a game loss from Sean. Anyway, that's the that's the big picture. And we have a more uh, detailed version of the standings we can put up that has all the tiebreakers in it because uh, we are going to wind up referring to those a few times tonight. Um, match wins, obviously, is where things start. You know, 3-0 and is better than 2-1, and but we could see some ties, especially given the way the schedule has worked out. So game wins is the first tiebreaker. Fewest game losses is the tiebreaker after that. And if it's just flat tied all the way down, it actually comes down to lifetime pro points. You and I, I think, are hoping it doesn't come down to that. Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't doesn't help me. <laughs> it doesn't help me either. I've got the little Hall of Fame next to my name, but uh, I will lose the pro point tiebreaker if I wind up in one with Paul Gian. Yeah. Yeah, there's a couple guys in here with a lot of pro points. Indeed. Your group in particular. Yeah. Yeah. But everyone's on the board. Gabby's got one. Yep. Yep. <laughs> no yeah, one she, Kenji, neither she or Kenji has played a pro tour, but both of them have done well at uh, Grand Prix level. Anyway, that's the big picture. Uh, we can look at the schedule tonight and uh, talk about who's going to be playing whom. We're going to kick things off by resolving Group A. It's going to be uh, Paul Rietzel versus Josh utter Layton in our very first match. And so this is Paul at 0-2, but with a shot. He needs to beat Josh utter Layton, and then he needs you to lose to Li Shi Tian. I, um, I haven't heard you saying good things about your matchup with Li Shi Tian. Well, I, I do think that Paul is... is He's certainly. I, I'm the good. I'm the good side of that for him. I think I'm more likely to lose than he is to win. Okay. Um, but that's just because my matchup is kind of poor. You know, I, I I I don't have. I don't have counter magic. I don't have anaphensas, and my opponent kind of has eight. Really good instance plus one bring the light, I guess. That yeah. So that are, matchup is it's rally for Li Shi Tian versus Green White Mega Morph for you. Yeah, and I I think my deck is probably not quite fast enough. I mean, he obviously his deck can fizzle. He can stumble on mana. He's got a lot of things going on. He's got... I, I, I mean, I, I can I can get aggressive draws and win, but I, I'm, I'm definitely a dog, I think. I, I don't... I guess it's... I don't know. I guess the fact that I have some silk wrap type effects is, is a little bit better um, than if I was didn't have those. Uh, but I think it's a tough matchup. Paul's matchup is... They're obviously both playing unusual decks. Paul's deck is sort of more normal now. You know, now that we've seen these kind of like <laughs> Esper token -y matches doing well in some tournaments. But his build, I feel like, is a little bit outdated already. Okay. Like he, does, he only has one um, of the make a bunch of one ones, right? Whatever that yep. card's called. Secure and, the waste. Right. The fact that he only has one secure the waste, I think... I think he, I'm sure he regrets that now. It seems like Secure the Wastes into Gideon or Soren is kind of how that deck kind of steals games. Um, and that, that's what he did game one against me. Um, yep. But with only one Secure the Wastes, it's obviously a lot harder for him to do that. And I don't know if... And it's a little bit tougher for him. He has, you know, he has the five sweepers, or I think main deck, right? And those are not as good when your opponent knows about them either. Um 
And, Josh, and, and Leighton is similarly rooting for you to lose, by the way. Just to be clear on the Group A scenarios, right. Paul needs to win and have you lose 0-2. Josh needs to win, and he just needs you to lose. If Josh wins, he's 2-1. If you lose, you're 1-2. So it would be Josh in cleanly in second. Uh, if you win, though, not only do you defeat Li Shi Tian, uh, you also win the group. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you can win the group uh, by beating Li. Yeah, and it's clean. You just beat him on, you'll beat him on uh, Game Wins tiebreakers. All right, well, I'm going to try to win. I think I, you know, I, I have no okay. idea how big of a dog you can, I, I really am. Oh, you have to beat it 2-0. That's what it is. You have to, if you win 2-0, then you get, you win the group. If you win 2-1, oh. he still wins the group. That's how it works. All right. Obviously on paper, it doesn't look like a great matchup, but you know, I don't, it's not like I'm 80-20. I and mean, if I was 80-20 or 20-80, then his, you know, everybody would be playing his deck. I think. But, so there's plenty of green light around. <laughs> Group B, by the way, uh, we have the, I guess, uh, weekend commentary warriors matchup between Cedric and myself. And uh, it's a little similar to the Paul versus Josh matchup in that we're both live for playoffs, but we have to win. Uh, if I beat Cedric, then I just need Paul to beat Eric. Uh, if Cedric beats me, he similarly needs Paul to beat Eric. But I think he has to, Paul has to beat Eric. Paul has to sweep Eric 2-0. So this is not a great matchup for you, right? Um, no, I actually think it's Harker Red versus uh, Green White Megamorph is okay. Like, so... But hasn't he kind of done things with his sideboard that make it much better, or no? He's done things against his sideboard that makes it better against the Palo Vitor version of Atarka Red. He's able to sideboard in Radiant Flames, which is really good against the, like, go wide with a bunch of Goblin Tokens version of Atarka Red. I don't oh, have any Dragon Fodders or Hordling Outbursts. I actually have sort of bigger creatures, right? I have Hooting Mandrels and, you know, F Flame Wake Phoenixes. So I'm not as vulnerable to Radiant Flames as the typical Atarka Red deck. And I, I I will admit that I haven't tested the matchup a ton. Oh, yeah, but, I'm looking at decks here, yeah. But I think that my red matches up better against uh, what Cedric has done with Green White than most red decks do. So I think I'm still supposed to be a, a favorite there. Not a huge favorite, and no. his red is certainly better than not having the red, but I don't feel like it's as devastating as uh, as his sideboard plane is against the more traditional builds of a Tarka red. Oh, that makes sense. Chion versus Efro is the big match, though. You know, Chion has clinched advancement, but would love the buy. Efro must win to guarantee advancement. He does have a scenario where he can potentially back in if Cedric beats me two one. Um, but mostly, I'm sure Eric just wants to take care of business. And he can actually, like you, he can win the group with a 2-0 in that match. Third group, like we mentioned, Kenji is eliminated. Uh, Gabby clinches advancement with a game win or a game loss from Sean. Uh, but any two of uh, Patrick, Sean, and Gabby can actually still get through, depending on, how, on the details of how those matches play out. So should, it should be a fun night. I mean, there's there's a lot on the line, a lot of drama here, and I don't know how things are going to turn out. No, and these I mean, they're, most of these games are going to end up being pretty great. I'm guessing standards of cool format, a lot of close games. Now, the way this plays out next week, so the top two from each group do make the playoffs. The playoffs next week, it's like a top eight bracket, but there's only six players, so the two best uh, group winners will get buys straight into the semifinal. It's the same format we used for the last Standard Super League, actually. Uh, so it's a six-person playoff bracket, five matches. We'll watch all five matches next week. It will be fresh decks next week, too, which is, I think, the crucial thing. I mean, we've had uh, we've had a couple of weeks with the decks we're currently playing, and Standard has done a lot of evolving. There have been a couple of Grand Prix, you know, there have been some open events. I'm, I'm definitely interested to see, you know, with the championship on the line, what are people actually going to bring to the table next week? What's, you know, what's, do you, I mean, I guess I don't want to get you to commit to anything, but I don't know if there's any standard decks you kind of wish you had played or, or might be interested in for next week. Oh, uh, well, yeah, I mean, I definitely agree that, like I said, some of these, some of these deck lists just feel straight up stale at this point. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Um, I mean, obviously, Grand Prix, uh, what was it, Indianapolis? Is that where that Grand Prix was? Yeah. Where, I mean, where it was just all, was it all abs in? Uh, there was a lot of Obs on that did well, yeah. And no Jess guy in the top eight, despite right. it being the most played deck. And, you know, in the Open tournament um, this weekend was also just mono Obs in. So, I, uh, obviously things have changed quite a bit since the Pro Tour, and I don't know whether it's cyclical or whether people actually figured stuff out or, or what. Um, I guess that's what I have to figure out. But, no, I mean, I have not... I, I don't have any standard deck that really... Uh, 
calls to me. So if I make it through, I'm going to have to uh, rethink everything. Yeah, I'm, I'm in kind of the same spot. I'm certainly hoping to make it through. I'd feel better if I controlled my own destiny. At least you control your own destiny. Like not only do you control your own destiny, you even have a scenario where you can back in with a loss, hypothetically. Yeah, only a little yeah. jealous, I guess. that you just have to win to get through it is a nice feeling. Yeah. Because winning and then not getting in is, is kind of a bummer. Yeah, thanks. Well, I had to, to, to take care of the winning part first. Matchup against Cedric will be... It should be tough, but fun. Let's talk about our first match, though. We're going to kick off tonight with uh, Paul Rietzel versus Josh Utter Layton. It'd uh, be nice to look at those guys' deck lists, if we can get uh, get a deck list up for this first matchup. Rietzel is on uh, Black White. Josh here is on Jeskai Mentor. This is a man who loves Jeskai in all, sort of all formats at all points in time. And now, coming out of the Pro Tour, Jeskai is actually good, so... Did not take much convincing, I'm sure, to get Josh to show up with this deck. Uh, this is a little bit of a different take on Jeskai. It's not dark Jeskai, right? There's no black mana in here. Uh, or, well, there's not much black mana. And there's no no main deck black, except for the two murderous cuts. What there is, is Monastery Mentor. Four yeah, this, copies. Yeah, this deck's like a real wild card. I feel like no one really... I don't think anyone has a strong opinion on how good this deck really is. You know, I think they had mixed results at the Pro Tour. Um, nothing great, um, but they, I think a couple of people put up decent finishes with it. I think Josh probably must have done. I think Luis did poorly. Lu Luis played this also, right? Um, if I recall. Yeah. But I know some people did really badly with it, but some people did okay, and Josh liked it enough to play play it again here. But no one really. I feel like it's just like I said. This is a weird deck. That's not people. People just aren't playing it. So this isn't one of those standard decks where people are like, oh, I know I'm a favorite. I know how to play against it. It's kind of a strange deck. You know, it's got exert influence main deck. Which is pretty unusual in the format. Yeah. Um, you know, he blew me out with the Dragon Lords out of the sideboard, which I, is which has now become more standard, of course. But true. Um, yeah, this is an interesting deck because I don't think anyone, you know, no one else is playing it. No one knows how good it is. And all right, yeah, no, I, it's fun to watch. I like to see the mentors try to do their thing. Let's look at Paul's list. Uh, Paul also a little bit out of left field with uh, one of the many attempts he's had to try to make a black rate, black white mid range deck. I know right. he played this a. Deck, this deck's unusual. I mean, the carrier <laughs> thrall obviously is the. I you know I see why it's there. Um, yeah. And I can see why he would think it might work, um, but it's pretty. It's not a card that people would consider really having like standard power level. Mm -hmm. um, I guess it's just hanger back walkers five through seven. Um, yeah, and I, and I, mean, I think he was he was trying to block effectively right he was trying to find cards that could soak up some damage and uh maybe right. you know just buy him some time in the early well, if you game. block with it if you block with it on the draw then you can play a turn three gideon or soren that's pretty cool um i think the biggest problem with it is that it can't block a mantis rider it's just just not right. very good at blocking that card yeah that's problematic for sure i mean this is an interesting deck you know it's got a lot of it looks like a bit of a kitchen sink. Um, you know, I mean, the other, I, are very solid in this matchup because he does, he's not playing against um, commands, which is good for him. I mean, I think what's going on here is we're kind of watching Paul Rietzel try to brew in real time. If you compare this list to the list that he played at Grand Prix Indianapolis, it's particularly interesting because he also played Black White there, but you could kind of see that, like, okay, the carrier thralls are gone now, and, like, the deck was evolving, and he was, like, making it incrementally better, making it incrementally better. Um, calling back to your Canadian Highlander note, by the way, there no, there's no shuffle effects in this deck. Right. And he, there are and no fetch lands in this deck. And I so think that that was like the 1% tiebreaker. We talked to him about this last week that kind of pushed him over the top to actually play this deck at the Grand Prix. Well, yes. Yeah, so Paul, long, for years now, has said that he thinks modern, they should just ban cards that have the word shuffle on them. So he's, all, yeah. he's long been a proponent of no fetch lands. And at the last modern Grand Prix, he top aided with Merfolk, which has no fetch lands in it. So he has actually been putting a lot of effort into not playing with fetch lands. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how much that's affecting his choices, but um, I think it's non-zero. Yeah, I think so too. But and yeah, I think that you know he's kind of taking all the Obzon colors and looking at all the different combinations of them. And can you make a two-color version of Obzon work? Right? What's the best? How do you play with some of the powerful cards that you could get from those colors, but not necessarily play all three of the colors and all the fetch lands and. I mean, it's interesting that he doesn't. I mean, so 
how much does it hurt you against Jeskai to have two Gideon, two Soren instead of four Gideon? Um, I think it's not great for you. Um, like if he just had four Gideon, I think his matchup here would be a bit better. Um, so yeah, I don't know. But is Read the Bones good against in this matchup? I, I, I'm just not sure that the card choices he has are going to serve him well in this kind of unusual matchup. But fair. Yeah, I think Read the Bones is better in his uh, Grand Prix Indie version of the deck because his Crayer of Thralls turned into Seeker of the Way. Seeker of the Way in particular. Like, you go turn two Seeker of the Way, turn three Read the Bones, get a Prowess Trigger, get some Life Link, uh, and at that point you can attack into a Mantis Rider and gain the three life. They're probably not going to make the trade there, right? right. So uh, I think Seeker of the Way is what Carrier Thrall turned into, which seemed like a nice upgrade of the deck, although it's not like Paul had a great Grand Prix. All right. No, I, he did not have a great Grand Prix. I mean, by, certainly not by his standards. I think he may have snuck into day two. Like, it won the, won the win and in and then didn't do particularly well in day two, which for Paul, I mean, his, his median Grand Prix this season, I think, is a top eight. I mean, his Grand Prix run this season was, was kind of overlooked. I, I think you mentioned it a couple times. On, on He's three Peter, top eights already. Right, he just top eighted three Grand Prix in a row to start the season. In three different formats while yeah. making the top four of Worlds in between. Yeah, and I think that at the limited Grand Prix, day two was like his second draft or something. Uh, well, the second draft was the second draft. Oh, so the first draft was his first draft? <laughs> yes, his first battle for Zendikar draft was in fact day you know nine a.m. day two of the Grand Prix in Madison. Now, to be fair, he was part of Team Ultra Pro, and they had he they had had their big phone call where they go over the limited format as part of their Pro Tour prep process. So, I mean, he'd been talking with very smart people who'd been doing a lot of testing for the Grand Prix. But yeah, I mean, he this is a guy who plays mostly on Magic Online. He just doesn't get to actually draft with physical booster packs and Magic cards very often. And uh, when the format's not on Magic Online, he basically doesn't get to draft it unless it's at a Grand Prix. Yeah, that's super that's impressive. Why, I, why I've skipped a lot of these uh, Grand Prix that are right when the set comes out because I'm kind of, I, I often don't find, just don't have the time that, if I don't have the time that one week to go draft, yep. it, you know, JB Park's house or wh wherever I would normally do a live draft, that just means I would have to go to the Grand Prix cold. It just doesn't seem worth the flight. In Paul's case, he's like going right for the, he's going to the Porto anyway. Yeah. So. You have any, uh, you have any big tournaments coming up for you? I'm going to Grand Prix Atlanta this weekend and nice. Grand Prix Pittsburgh next weekend. So back to back. Ah, very nice. It's, it's very interesting how, how the past 12 months I've probably been going to like the average of a grant, two Grand Prix every three months or something like that. But this is now the third time I've gone to Grand Prix on back to back weekends. Like the scheduling, <laughs> the scheduling just does not, like if you're trying to, equally space your Grand Prix where you just really go to one about once a month, it never works out. You like sure. don't play one for three months and have to go to a Grand Prix like three weeks in a row. All right. <laughs> so yeah, I've got two in a row coming up. Good luck to you. I will not be in Atlanta, but I will see you in uh, in Pittsburgh. Cool. Have you figured out what you're playing in Pittsburgh? Uh I am probably I'm not I have, I have not figured it out. Normally in modern uh I've played a lot of Jund and a bit of twin um, I'm not super excited about either of those. Um, I'm probably on Jund, Merfolk, or switching to something really unfair. But I, I haven't decided which of the unfair decks I would switch to yet. Okay. And then Atlanta is limited, of course, or anyone out yeah. there who doesn't have the premier event schedule memorized like some of us do. We've got uh, players sitting down, getting set up right now. Uh, Paul Rietzel is... Uh, Going to be playing against Josh Utter Layton as soon as we have those guys into a game. We'll head down to it. And we talked about this, setting it up to, just in case you're joining us. Paul and Josh both need to win and then watch eagerly as Chris takes on Lee Shi Tian in the last match. Uh, Chris Lee has already clinched. Chris can clinch playoffs um, with a win there and can, in, in fact, win the group with a 2 0 win. So both those guys are going to need some help. But step number one is they got to win their matchup. So we're going to find out who's. Maybe because Lee's already clinched, maybe he's just going to be like watching Breaking Bad during our match. <laughs> Eagerly looking at his watch because he wants to leave the house. It's right, like a morning like, there. Taking a cake. Just something. Something to distract him. I think the buy is quite valuable. Yeah. 
That's yeah, true. the buy is a big I deal, know. and I mean the stakes for the finals are are not insignificant. I mean uh, the pride is a big deal. I think most of us just like the idea of trying to play a tournament against good players and win. But there is actually a foil play set of standard on the line. That's... So on Magic Online, the winner gets four copies of every card in standard in foil on Mitco. Yeah, that's pretty insane. It's not bad. <laughs> that is pretty, that is pretty cool. I mean, it's, so... it is the culmination of. A whole six-month-long tournament series. We played vintage. We played modern. We played standard. We had an LCQ, and yeah, I uh, I asked Watsy if they wanted to put a nice, sexy prize on the top of it, and they agreed to it. So, man, just I just want the I just want the foil Jaces. That'd be good enough. Yeah, right? that's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> like, just a foil play set of Jaces would be just, fine. Yeah, just just give me the Jaces. I'll figure out everything else. <laughs> Second prize, by the way, is. Uh, Gideon's not bad. Yeah, Gideon's a pretty good team. Uh, second place is two uh, two copies of every card in standard, although regular copies of the cards, no no more premiums. And then it goes down to like it's a set of BFZ for fifth and sixth place. So everybody who makes the playoffs wins some Magic Online product, and uh, the winner gets to gets to bling out whatever standard decks that they want to win want, want to play with for for a while here. Yeah, all of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's, until new sets come in, right? Sure. That's all. But eventually, those cards you might you might need to track down. A, a yeah. So is is set. so how's the new rotation work? Is Jace in standard for shorter, or Jace is in the standard for same? But the but the eighteen months. He's shorter. He is shorter. Okay. Yeah. So cards are in standard for eighteen months now. Basically, they rotate every three mini blocks. They okay. rotate one out. So it'll always be three of these uh, two set blocks from here on out. Right, in other well, words, we lose we lose Siege Rhino in what is it? In the spring. Alright. Well since Jace is vintage playable, I think it's gotta it'll maintain its value. <laughs> uh, indeed. Yeah, yeah, not just modern playable, but uh vintage playable. It is still interesting to me the cards that like skip one format, like they're good in modern and vintage, but not legacy or whatever. It's, it's always strange to me how it works out that way. All right, I think we got a match. We are going to head down to the action. We're going to find out which of Paul Rietzel and Josh Hunter Layton are going to be rooting against Chris Pakula in the next round. So stay tuned, guys. We're heading on our way down to the, down to the match. <laughs> 